So we've just spent some time praying, and I want us to think as we begin to look at our passage, we're going to study from John 17, kind of the middle section of the chapter. Um, Each of us probably in different ways have experienced the power of prayer for one another. Maybe you've been a part of a home group. Maybe you've been a part of a, a, a prayer ministry where you saw how praying for each other's needs, you saw God respond, and you saw the power and encouragement that came out of that. When we share needs that we have and we pray for each other, it's encouraging when God responds um, in a particular way, but it also draws us together. Have you noticed that when you share something that's, that's on your heart, that's, that's special or particular or a, a deep need, and you share it with others, and they receive and pray for you, it creates unity in the body. Um, it also gives us perspective. You think about, okay, this brother over here shares a request, and I go, well, I struggle with that same thing. It gives us perspective that people around us are wrestling with the same difficulties, the same issues of sin, the same struggles. And it creates community, creates brotherly love. Um, within the church, within the body. And beyond what we're going to see today, um, Jesus praying for his disciples, we know from Scripture that Jesus himself prays for his kids, for us as believers. Two really clear Scriptures, one in Hebrews 7, it says, So he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. This is Jesus we're talking about. And in Romans, Paul tells us again, Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is the one who will condemn? Christ is the one who died. And more than that, he was raised, who's at the right hand of God, and who also is interceding for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will trouble or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? We often talk about prayer and we, we preach, preach sermons and do Bible studies about how we should pray. But I want to focus today on how Jesus prays for us. We don't typically think about Jesus voicing prayers for us. We talk about, we pray for each other, we pray for needs. But Jesus prays for us. And I found a really neat quote from Robert Murray McShane, who was a a Scottish minister in the 1800s. If I could hear Christ praying for me in the next room, I would not fear a million enemies. Yet the distance makes no difference. He is praying for me. The current reality is Jesus is praying for us, even now. Let's look at this passage and get a glimpse of what that prayer might sound like. In fact, if we could eavesdrop on Jesus praying for us, what would we hear? What would he pray for for you and me? We're going to see a picture of that in the passage as Jesus is praying for his disciples. We'll get an idea. What are Jesus' priorities when he prays for us? What are the things in his heart? We'll see that as he prays for his disciples. So let's read it. I have revealed your name to the men you gave me out of the world. They belong to you and you gave them to me. And they have obeyed your word. Now they understand that everything you have given me comes from you. Because I have given them the words you have given me. They accepted them and really understand that I came from you. And they believe that you sent me. I'm praying on behalf of them. I'm not praying on behalf of the world. But on behalf of those you have given me. Because they belong to you. Everything I have belongs to you. And everything you have belongs to me. And I have been glorified by them. I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them safe in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one just as we are one. When I was with them, I kept them safe and watched over them in your name that you have given me. Not one of them was lost except one destined for destruction, so that the scripture could be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you and I am saying these things in the world so that they may experience my joy completed in themselves. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. 
I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but that you keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Set them apart in the truth. Your word is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, so I sent them into the world. And I set myself apart on their behalf, so that they too may be truly set apart. So we're going to see in this prayer, this is a prayer that Jesus prayed specifically about his disciples, the eleven that were remaining, because Judas had already left the upper room and was betraying Jesus, probably as he's praying. Um, We're going to see in this text how Jesus prays for his disciples in this most important prayer recorded in the Bible. We're going to see what Jesus desires for his followers as he leaves earth and is returning to heaven. So just a quick, quick, quick reminder of where we've come from. So over the summer, Gavino prayed, uh, he prayed, but he preached through uh, John 13 through 16, which we often call the upper room discourse. That's that intimate section of John where Jesus is ministering specifically to his disciples. If you remember, most of the book of John is written to people who don't know Jesus and need to know him. And it's, it's trying to instruct them how to trust in Jesus to be saved. But this section, 13 through 17, is Jesus' specific ministry to his own, his disciples. So he's speaking to believers, and he's speaking to us as well. And if you remember, chapter 17 is a whole prayer that Jesus is praying, and it's arguably the most important prayer recorded in the Bible. For some reason, Jesus wanted us to be able to eavesdrop on one of his prayers, to know his heart. Um, And if you remember, we saw in the beginning part of the prayer, Jesus is praying specifically for himself. And he talks about the two key aspects of his relationship with his father. The one thing he focused on was they had an intimacy that was perfect. No rivals in their intimacy. No distance between father and son. Perfect intimacy. And then Jesus showed us that the passion that he has for his father's glory came out of that intimacy. Because he was so close to his father, because he loved his father so much, he desired to see his father lifted up. And so Jesus' whole life and ministry is pointing to glory to the father and then subsequently glory to himself. So we move from Jesus' prayer to himself. Now he's shifting. And if you'll notice, there are only five verses recorded of his prayer for himself. And a whole bunch of verses praying for his disciples. We can assume that they probably really need the prayers, right? If they're anything like we are, they need prayer. So that's that's Jesus' priority here. So he's going to start out, and he's going to give us some context and some of the reasons why he's going to pray for his disciples. In this passage, it's interesting what Bob was talking about with the Jehovah's Witnesses. This is a very rich passage, has lots of information about the Trinity, about very deep doctrine about Christ and we're going to flesh a little bit of that out so starting out he says I have revealed your name to the men you gave me out of the world they belong to you and you gave them to me and they have obeyed your word so Jesus says I have revealed your name if you remember biblically speaking a name someone's name uh, carried the weight of their character if you think about in, in ancient England, when someone would come up to the castle and say, open the drawbridge in the name of the king. Well, it wasn't that the king was right there, but whoever was coming up had the weight of the king, his name, his right, so they had to open the gate. So when Jesus is revealing God's name, it's saying that Jesus is making known the character of his father. And we know from the scriptures that It says, if you want to see the Father, look at Jesus, right? He perfectly embodies his Father in flesh. And then Jesus says, talks about the men you gave me. If you remember from what we studied in the beginning part of chapter 17, God elected, chose, decided who would be his before the beginning of time. We don't understand this, but it's what the scripture teaches. And so... At some point, the Father gave those He had chosen to the, to the Son as a gift, right? All believers were given from the Father to the Son as a gift, okay? We don't completely understand election, predestination, that we were chosen before the beginning of time, but it's what the Scripture teaches. 
But also in the same verse, he says, they belong to you, you gave them to me. So these are the disciples, all believers that were given to the Son, and they have obeyed your word. So they were chosen, we as believers were chosen before time. But this second part, they have obeyed your word. There's also some human responsibility. Yes, God chose us, but we have to respond to the gospel. We aren't just saved automatically. We have to say yes to the gospel. We have to trust in Jesus and bank our eternity on him. So there's this tension. Yes, God is sovereign and elected, predestined believers. But believers must respond to the gospel. They have to place their trust in Jesus to be saved. So there's this tension that the Bible gives us. It doesn't let us sit in one little category. There's a tension between human responsibility and God's sovereignty. They're both present. And we see them both right here in this verse. And then he says, now they understand, he's talking about the disciples, now they understand that everything you have given me comes from you because I have given them the words you have given me. They accepted them and really understand that I came from you and they believe that you sent me. So everything comes from you. Uh, the disciples have understood from Jesus that the Father is the source of everything in his ministry. The Father is the one who has sent him. The words that you have given me, uh, what Jesus is talking about here, are the Father's words. The disciples recognize that God the Father was speaking through God the Son and that the authority that he had came from the Father. And these words that Jesus has been teaching and speaking all these years are authoritative. They have power behind them because they come from the Father. They're authoritative for life, for practice, and to be saved for eternity, right? So we're not talking just worldly things, good advice, but words that can change your eternal destiny. And Jesus says, I came from you. The disciples understood that Jesus came from the Father, that Jesus is the Messiah who is specifically on a mission from the Father, sent from the Father. Okay? So probably the most important thing, most important reason why Jesus prays for his disciples is in verse 9. I am praying on behalf of them. I'm not praying on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those you have given me because they belong to you. And then he goes on and says, everything I have belongs to you and everything you have belongs to me. So by default, believers have been given by the Father to the Son. They're possessed by the Father. They're possessed by the Son. This is why he prays for us. Because of this intimate relationship, we are precious to Jesus that's why he prays for us. You think about it, it's easier to remember requests of the people that are closest to us. Your brother is on your heart because you love him, right? And so it's going to come back to your mind to pray. It's a little bit harder to pray for people we don't know. You think of we pray for people through Open Doors, the Porta Aperte ministry that prays for the persecuted church. It's a little harder to remember people that we're not in contact with. But our family, our friends, they're so intimate to our hearts, we pray for them more readily. It's easier. Now, obviously, Jesus, I don't think he struggles with praying for anyone. But the reason why he's praying for his disciples is because he loves them. Because there's an intimate connection. They belong to him. They belong to his Father. And there's a big encouragement in verse 10. Everything I have belongs to you, and everything you have belongs to me. And I have been glorified by them. Them, meaning the disciples, the past three years that they've been together. Do you remember the disciples before the resurrection were a bumbling group of wannabe disciples, right? I mean, they really didn't have it together. These guys were fishermen. They weren't professionally trained ministers. Jesus was discipling them, training them. And then when the Spirit came, everything changed, right? But he's saying, these bumbling men, these fishermen who were not professional ministers, have glorified me. They made lots of mistakes. I've been glorified by them, Jesus says. What encouragement for us. We make plenty of mistakes. We're quite bumbling at our faith. But we can glorify Jesus. We were created to glorify him. 
What an encouragement that his bumbling disciples glorified him, and we have that privilege. Being his children, we have the privilege to glorify him. And then very practically, why is he praying for his disciples? I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. I am coming to you. Jesus is saying, tomorrow I die, and I will rise again, and I will ascend into heaven. I know I'm going away. I need to pray for these guys because they're going to get the shock of their lives when they watch me die on the cross, and then I go away. They've lived with me for three years. They've lived with, with God incarnate for three years, and then suddenly he's not going to be there. They're, he's going to send the Spirit... And the Spirit will be a powerful influence in their lives. But what a shock to go from being able to hug and hold on to Jesus, God incarnate, to I have His spiritual presence through the Spirit in me. It's very different, right? You can embrace someone and feel their presence physically to having to uh, feel the presence in a spiritual sense. It's very different. So Jesus knows these men need prayer because I'm going away. And then He prays, Five or six different things specifically for them. The first thing, he's going to pray for unity among them. Holy Father, keep them safe in your name that you have given me so that they may be one just as we are one. He says, keep them safe in your name. As you know, all of us are always at risk of going astray. His disciples were at risk of going astray, falling away. If there wasn't a risk, Jesus wouldn't have prayed this, right? He prays it because it's, it's a legitimate risk. But the most important thing for us to remember as believers, once we have trusted Jesus, even if we go astray, what matters is that his grip on us is firm and secure. There's some days when we feel like we've got a really good hold on Jesus. I'm doing good today, God. I'm holding on to you. And then the next day, we're a mess. We don't have any, any grab a hold on him. But to know that his grip is never slipping with us. He holds us in his hand. His father holds us in his hand. That's what we can be secure in and rest in that our salvation depends on him holding on to us. So why does he want to keep them safe in his father's name so that they could be unified? Now, we're not talking about uniformity. He's not saying, I want little cookie-cutter stamped Christians, that they're all perfectly aligned and all, we're all different. God made each of us very different. So he wants unity, but not uniformity. If you've noticed, as you've studied about who Jesus is and what happens to us as, as new creations in Christ, Jesus is the only one that tears down every wall. He tears down economic barriers. He tears down gender barriers, racial barriers. We are all equal in Christ. Jesus is the only one that levels all of the playing field. Every believer looks each other eye to eye. There are no superior or inferior, A class or B class. No. The playing field is perfectly level in Jesus. We're all on the same level. Jesus is the only one in the universe that brings us all together in true unity. And it's a unity that's based on our new birth, who we are in Jesus. It's not, we don't have this little religious club and we all kind of like Jesus, so we're uni No. We're unified because He has radically altered who we are. We have a new heart. We have a new identity. That is the unity. It's something at a much deeper level. It's not, we have similar interests, we like the same things, we belong to the same social circle. No. It's the new heart that we all possess and the spirit that lives inside of us. He wants a unity that mirrors the unity that exists between father and son. He's saying, Father, you and I have perfect intimacy. There's no distance between us. That's what I want for our children on earth. And the context he gives us in verse 12 he says, when I was with them, I kept them safe and watched over them in your name that you have, given, you have given me. Not one of them was lost except the one destined for destruction so that the scripture could be fulfilled. What Jesus is saying is, while on earth, I walked with my disciples, I kept them out of trouble. I protected them from the wolves. When I go, 
I'm going to send the Spirit, but they're going to need power from on high to not go astray. Uh, Jesus knows he's going home to heaven. He'll be at the right hand of the Father soon. And he talks about this one that was lost, one destined for destruction. He's talking about Judah, right? Who had just betrayed him, had just walked out of the upper room discourse, walked out from the Lord's Supper. Judas, sorry, not Judah, Judas. <laughs> I'm thinking of the Italian. It's, it's, it's Judah in Italian. So Judas. So Judas has just betrayed Jesus. Judas had never trusted Jesus, had never become a believer. And the scriptures had foretold that there would be one who would betray Jesus, right? It was prophesied before. The scriptures are being fulfilled as Jesus is praying. Judas is going out to betray Jesus. And uh, we know that's what was prophesied of before. So the first thing that he prays for is unity among believers. Then he prays in verse 13 that we would have a profound and interior joy. But now I'm coming to you and I'm saying these things in the world so that they may experience my joy completed in themselves. Now, we throw around the world jo- throw around the word joy a lot. Just I know in in our American vocabulary we say I love this, I love cookies and cakes, I love my family. We we use those words loosely. Joy, love, we use those lo- loosely. But we know that the world and all of its uh, experiences that it offers, all it can provide at its best is a form of happiness. Because what the world offers us is based on circumstances. If things are going well for you today, you're happy, right? If you're feeling well, if you're healthy, you're well fed, you're happy. But that's based on circumstances. And the next minute, you get some bad news, the happiness is gone. Boom, in an instant. What Jesus is talking about is something much deeper. And the truth is, what the world offers, no one that doesn't have Christ can experience true joy. The world says, oh, I'm joyful. It's not true joy. It's happiness that they're talking about. Christ is saying, I offer a joy at your core, a deep core joy despite circumstances. Um, I don't know if if some of you have uh, gone through a, a terrible trial, and then in the midst of that, as you clung to Jesus, you felt a core peace, a core Rest, Even though there was a hurricane going on around you in your life, there was just this anchor, this rock, this rest, this peace, this profound joy. That's what Jesus is talking about. And his desire is that all of us would live with this profound core heart joy on the inside, despite what's going on around us. It's something that should distinguish us from the world Regardless of if we're happy or not, we should be able to live with this core joy. And arguably, we could say, looking at our own heart, and only we really know if there's joy in our heart or not, joy is a gauge of intimacy with Jesus. Because if we are walking intimately with Jesus, He will produce this joy in us. So it's not something to feel guilty about. It's just a good personal gauge to say, Okay, I don't have a lot of joy in my life right now. I'm probably not very close to Jesus right now. I want that joy back. I need to reconnect with the Lord so that I can have that joy. It's a good gauge of intimacy for us. So Jesus prayed for a profound and interior joy for his disciples. He also prayed for protection from the world. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but that you keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. So, the world hates his disciples. And if you notice, the world hates Christians. At least Christians that that live out their faith. Because the world wants conformity. It wants us to accept their perspective and what they do. And their practice. I've noticed a trend in the states. Um, we've seen with the uh, the whole homosexual agenda that 
it has moved over the past 10 or 15 years from you just need to accept the gay agenda to you have to come alongside us. You have to embrace us. And our, it's not just we respect you and your right to think the way you want to think and do what you want to do. It's you have to be in agreement with us now. The world wants to conform Christians to its perspective and its practice. It demands conformity. The world hates us because we are different. Because we live by God's truth. Interestingly, though, Jesus wants to protect his disciples, but he's not saying, God, take them out of this horrible, disgusting world. He doesn't pray that. He says, I don't want to take them out of the world. Our tendency as believers is to go to one of two extremes. One extreme is, I'm going to isolate myself from the world. I'm going to live up in the mountains, away from all of this, this ugly world around me, and I'm going to be holy and and. The problem is, who do we bring when we go and isolate ourselves? We bring us, our flesh. So even if we isolate ourselves from the world, we've got our own junk, our own flesh that's going to make us sin. So that doesn't work. It doesn't work to say, I'm going to live separated from the world. I'm going to keep myself sealed off from the world to protect myself. So that's one extreme. The other extreme is, we get so comfortable with the world, we just start acting like it. We either isolate ourselves off or we begin to conform to the world. And we just start to do what the world does. We make decisions as the world does. We think, we process, we act like the world does. Jesus is saying, no. I want you to be in the world, but not of it, right? You have to exist in the world. You have to work among non-believers. You uh, make friends with non-believers. You have neighbors that are non-believers. You live in the world, but I don't want you to be the world. I want you to be ambassadors for me. I want you to be salt and light in a dark place that has lost its flavor. The world is flavorless. It doesn't have any, any flavor anymore. God wants us to bring his light and his salt to bring life and taste. <clears throat> so protection from the world. In the world, but not of the world. And then he says, I want them to be set apart for this mission that I have for them. Set them apart in the truth. Your word is truth. Obviously, God's word, the Bible, is, is our truth. And it's a means of sanctification. Um, he wants us to hold to his truth, to learn his truth, to know it. And that we might be able to live by it. We'd be separated, set apart. Not isolated, but different. God's truth is what distinguishes us from the world. We live by a different set of standards. Holy ones. Ones from God, right? And it makes us stand out. If we live by those, people kind of go, you're different. Not necessarily in a good way. They don't always say that in a kind way. You're different. So Jesus wants his disciples and wants us to be set apart for mission for his mission for us, just like he was set apart. And then he wants us to be sent, just as he was sent. Just as you sent me into the world, Jesus talking to his Father, so I send them into the world. Think with me for a second about the Trinity. So Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Father sent Jesus on a mission. He was born a baby, took on human flesh, out of glory, into the dung heap of earth, right? God sent Jesus on a very humbling mission. Okay. Then, the Son, as He dies, is buried, is risen, goes up to heaven, sends the Spirit on a mission to live in believers. Jesus leaves and He sends the Holy Spirit. And now, every believer, when they trust Christ, the Spirit comes to live inside them. And then... The Son sends out you and me. He sends out believers. The Great Commission. Go into all the world and make disciples. We're all called as sent ones. We're on a mission. He has sent us out. And if you think about it, when Jesus uh, ascended into heaven, he sits at the right hand of the Father now, the Bible tells us. We are his flesh on earth. We become the hands and feet of Christ. We are his flesh and bones on earth. His way of 
meeting needs, speaking love, speaking truth, touching people tangibly, physically. Jesus uses us as his instruments. We become the body of Christ, the flesh of Christ on earth. We are an extension of Jesus. And then he closes out in verse 19. And I set myself apart on their behalf so that they too may be truly set apart. Um, Jesus is, is just reminding them that he's about to go to the cross. He has set himself apart, has prepared himself for this mission that the Father sent him on. He's going to follow through all the way to the end. He's preparing himself so that we might be set apart and prepared to go in mission. I want to end going back to this quote. If I could hear Christ praying for me in the next room, I would not fear a million enemies. Yet the distance makes no difference. He is praying for me. There is a comfort in knowing that there are other believers that are praying for us when we're suffering, when we're struggling, when there's an issue that's out of our hands. But how much more powerful would it be if we were reminded that Jesus himself is praying for us continually? That the King of kings and the Lord of lords, God incarnate, who loves us, who we belong to, is praying for us. Let's remember that and the power that's behind that as Jesus prays for us. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you, um, you've given us your son and that your son prays for us. God, it's hard for me to think of or imagine that Jesus is praying for me, praying for each of us right now. Lord, thank you for this chapter that gives us an idea. What is Jesus praying for us? We see it in this chapter. God, I pray that we would be reminded that you are praying these things over us. Lord Jesus, thank you for praying for us. Give us comfort. Remind us. What an encouragement it is to know that we not only have brothers and sisters on earth that pray for us, but we have a God who intercedes on our behalf. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.